Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be back in Silicon Valley. Uh, so my talk is going to be about a simple holographic model of black hole evaporation. Um, so the black hole information problem is like one of our favorite problems in theoretical physics. Um, you know, it's like many of the great uh, inconsistencies in the past which led us to change the laws of physics. So, for example, like the infrared catastrophe in classical thermodynamics or, or Maxwell's equations without the displacement current. You know, it's telling us that our current understanding of the world is incomplete. Um, and so since Hawking's paper, we've been working on it for a while, the way it's gone is that, you know, there, it's been kind of slow periods, and then every now and then there's a new idea and then things develop quickly for a while. Um, so yeah, and then, and then there are occasional periods where things get exciting. Um, and actually, I think right now is one of those periods. Uh, so we're lucky. Right now is, uh, is one of those occasional periods where we're learning a lot, and so I'm going to try to convey a little bit of that to you. Um, and so since time is short, um, I'm just going to focus on one part of this, which is this model um, that Chris Akers and, and Netta, somewhere here, and uh, myself proposed a few months ago. Uh, which was inspired by a couple of papers earlier this year by Pennington and then by uh, Netta and Ahmed and Don Merolf and Henry Maxfield. Um, and I, I, since you know this is supposed to be about experiments, I'll have some comments about experiments, but only only at the end. Uh, okay, so the arena for these new developments is this ADS CFT correspondence, which you've been hearing about for the last two days. It's kind of our our best theory of quantum gravity so far. Uh, the basic idea is that you have quantum gravity in asymptotically ADS space. So that's this thing on the left. And then it's supposed to be equivalent to some quantum field theory, which is living um, on the boundary, this shaded gray region here. Uh, and then we like that because the quantum field theory doesn't have gravity. And so that makes it easier to understand. Now, in as it, so you know, the, the fun thing in quantum gravity, or was it somebody said simple thing, I think Monica said, uh, is, uh, is that it has black holes. Um, and in ADS, there's two kinds of black holes. So there are so-called small black holes, um, which are the black holes that don't really notice that they're in ADS. They're so small that they behave just like black holes in flat space, and in particular, they evaporate. Um, so, uh, so these are the kind of more conventional black holes. Um, then there are what we like to call big black holes, which are big enough that they do know that they're living in ADS space. Um, and in particular, um, Although they still produce Hawking radiation, the, the radiation bounces off of the asymptotic boundary of ADS and comes back into the black hole uh, fast enough that the black hole doesn't evaporate. Um, so, so big black holes are eternal in ADS. Um, now, Hawking's formulation of the information problem only works for small black holes, right? Where Because you, you, you have to wait for the black hole to evaporate, and then you see if the state of the Hawking radiation is pure or mixed. Um, but unfortunately, in ADS CFT, we're not so good at thinking about the small black holes. We kind of formally know some things about them, but in terms of saying concrete things, there's not too much that we can say. Um, so one approach is that you try to formulate a different kind of information problem uh, you know, in, directly for the big black holes. Um, and so there is something like that, which is based on looking at the long time behavior of correlation functions, which Juan proposed uh, in 2001. And then uh, Phil Saad, who I think is here somewhere. Phil, are you here? Yeah, he's there. So yeah, so he wrote a very nice paper about this uh, maybe a month ago. Uh, and then there are also related ideas where instead of looking at correlation functions, you look at this thing called the spectral form factor. Um, but I'm instead going to talk about an alternative idea where instead of uh, trying to find some different version of the information problem that works for big black holes, you instead modify the CFT dynamics so that even the big black holes are allowed to evaporate. And then if even the big ones can evaporate, then we can try to formulate an information paradox for those. Um, and so that, I think there was some paper by Roca, I guess, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, which kind of first tried to do this. And then there were these two recent papers developing the idea further. Um, so how do you evaporate a big black hole? Well, the idea is pretty simple. Uh, you take a CFT, which is dual to some nice ADS quantum gravity, and then you couple it to an external many-body system. Uh, so if you like, you put it in contact with a heat bath. And once you do that, then the Hawking radiation from the big black hole, it doesn't always get reflected off of the boundary anymore. There are some 
transmission probability that it goes through into whatever the auxiliary system is. Um, and then so then uh, since we're thinking of the auxiliary CM system as being some big many body system, many more degrees of freedom than the holographic CFD, then uh, when the energy leaks out there, it doesn't come back. It's like a balloon which is deflating. Um, and so then uh, this gives a new channel for the black hole to decay. Um, and in particular, you know, after it decays, after all the energy has leaked out into the auxiliary system, you can ask whether the final state of the auxiliary system is pure, if the, if the black hole started out pure. Uh, and if it is, then, that's, you know, then that kind of is information conservation. And if it's not, then somehow information was lost. OK. Um, no, of course, we, we know that the answer is that it's pure, because we're just taking one quantum mechanical system and we're coupling it to another one. And since it started out in a pure state, it's going to end in a pure state. Okay. So, that's, so that's not really the question. The real, the real question is, is whether or not we can get a bulk description of how this uh, unitary evaporation happened. Okay, that's what we're really after. Um, I mean, I guess there are still people who think it's not unitary, but probably everyone in this room thinks it's unitary. Uh, or doesn't dare to admit if they don't. <laughs> um, so, so, so the new, the new progress, uh, you know. So this paper of Roca, right? It was a long time ago, but but there was the the new progress is being driven by um, uh, two recent developments in our understanding of ADS CFT, uh, which uh, our entanglement wedge reconstruct called they're called entanglement wedge reconstruction and the quantum extremal surface prescription. And here's a some subset of the papers that uh, introduce these things. Um, so I don't have time to explain them in detail, so I'm just going to draw a picture. This may be the most cryptic part of the talk, but I'll try to break it down. So, so, this, uh, this, so this can of soup here, that's ADS. Okay? And uh, like the, the boundary, the metal you know, that's holding the soup, that's the, the CFT. Um, and then the idea is that um, something that we like to do is we take a spatial subregion of the boundary, which is here this interval r. So time is going up. So this disk here is a time slice of the gravitational theory. Okay, and and the geometry on this time slice is like this Escher picture that you sometimes people see in their talks. Okay, so then a time slice of the boundary theory is this circle here. Uh, this. R here is this interval. It's a spatial subregion of the boundary time slice, which is the circle. So then the idea is that um, there are two natural questions that you can ask, and which are related to these two things. So the first is, if I give you a state of the boundary CFT, and then I reduce to just the reduced state on this subregion R, what's the von Neumann entropy of that state? And the answer to that is given by, well, originally the Rutaki Nagi formula, but for this we have to go a little bit fancier. So, this quantum extremal surface prescription. So, here's the formula for the von Neumann entropy of the state on R. And the idea is that there's this magic surface here, gamma R, which is uh, this uh, connects the endpoints of the boundary region to each other and goes through the bulk. Um, and I'll tell you how to find the surface in a sec. But anyway, once you found the surface, the idea is then you look at its area divided by 4G, plus some corrections we don't care about. Uh, and then you add to it the entropy of bulk fields, of the bulk degrees of freedom in between this surface and R. And then that gives you the von Neumann entropy of this boundary region. Uh, and then the way you find this gamma R is that you take the thing on the right-hand side of this, you extremize it over all possible gamma R. If there's more than one extremum, you take the minimum. Okay. So the details don't matter too much. We just have we have this surface gamma r. You know, roughly speaking, its area tells us the von Neumann entropy of this region r. Uh, and then, moreover, so this entanglement wedge reconstruction, it says that in fact everything in the bulk that's in between these two and actually kind of within this wedge of cheese, which is called the domain of dependence, uh, someone who has access only to the CF degree, CFT degrees of freedom r here can learn everything that's going on in this wedge of cheese. Okay. So if that was too fast, don't worry about the details. I just had to say it. Um, the idea is then to use entanglement wedge reconstruction, which means this algorithm for, for taking what's in this wedge here and describing it in the CFT in this subregion R, um, to study the question of when information um, that falls into the black hole becomes accessible um, from the radiation which has leaked out into the auxiliary system. Uh, so uh, 
the, there are various ways to try to formulate that more precisely. Maybe the cleanest one is to use this thing called the page curve. So the idea of the page curve is that you take the auxiliary system that energy is leaking out into, and you plot its von Neumann entropy as a function of time. OK, so here's time. Here's the von Neumann entropy. And then there's kind of two options for what you expect. So if you think that information is conserved, which we do, then, well, the, the auxiliary system starts out in a pure state. Say it's a bunch of qubits, they're all 0. Okay? Um, as the evaporation proceeds, um, that state gradually gets mixed because it gets entangled with the black hole that was sitting there in the original holographic system. So the von Neumann entropy starts going up. But eventually, the black hole is going to evaporate. And so then the radiation is going to have to be in a pure state. So this is going to have to end up down here again. And so then it has to turn over somewhere in the middle and come back down. Okay. Whereas had you believed in information loss, you would have said the final state of the radiation is mixed. So you would have said this just keeps going up, 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 and then it sits up here at a mixed state. Okay. Um, so, 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 so this bottom one is what we think actually happens. Um, so then what was shown in these recent papers is that when you couple an ADS black hole to an auxiliary system and you use this quantum extremal surface prescription, well, it seems to give you a page curve that does this. It goes up, and then it comes back down. So that's some kind of bulk calculation that seems to know that information is conserved. Now, I want to pause here, since this is supposed to be a, you know, a cultural exchange, and point out to the experimentalists something that may is, maybe is a bit unfamiliar about this slide. So this is a slide which has one plot on it. Not two, not three, one. And moreover, I um, told you what the axes were without having to be asked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, continuing. <laughs> so I'm not going to. What do you mean by seems? You said it seems to. Yeah, be we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. OK, so. so I, I'm not going to discuss the details of these calculations. This is not the right place for that. Um, but I want to mention two issues which come up. So the first is that, although I'm not going to tell you about the calculations, I'll tell you that they're hard. Well, I mean, people can do them, but, they're, but they are hard. They're not NP complete or whatever, but they're reasonably hard. Um, and the reason is because when you use this formula for the entropy, you have to use this bulk entropy term. Um, and this bulk entropy, it's kind of difficult to deal with. So just as a matter of practice, it would be nicer if we only had to use the area term, and then we're just doing geometry. We're not having to worry about the entropy of bulk fields. So that's just a practical concern. It's not a conce serious conceptual concern. Um, there is, how, uh, however, a conceptual issue in the calculations, which is that the Lorenzian dynamics, which are used to do them, are the same ones that Hawking used to conclude that there is information loss. Okay? And um, in fact, if you look at the final state of the bath that you get out of these Lorenzian calculations, it's mixed. And this seems to really directly contradict the quantum extremal surface calculation. And so this is something that bothered many of us uh, over the last uh, you know, six months or so. Um, now, I should emphasize that this apparent contradiction is not really a mathematical contradiction, because the dynamics which were used in these papers are not holographic. They're just uh, bulk matter fields coupled to gravity. So it's not something that by itself is holographic. So it's not like we found an inconsistency in mathematics. Um, but it does tell us that something is missing, and we need to figure out what is missing from these calculations. OK, now an aside for the experts, the rest of you can ignore this. So some of you might say that replica wormholes are the thing that's missing. Um, but let me say that those only seem to contribute to the path integral when you average over theories. And I want to know how information gets out in a fixed theory. And I also want to know the, Lorenzi, you know, the actual Lorenzian dynamics. OK. So if you want to fight with me about this paragraph, do it later. I don't want to fight about it now. Um, so recently, with uh, Netta and Chris, um, we proposed an alternative um, coupling of a holographic CFT to an auxiliary system, which avoids both of these issues. So that's why I wanted to mention them. OK, and so that's what I want to tell you about now. Um, so in our model, there are no large bulk entropies, or really it's derivatives of bulk entropies that matter. So, um, so you can do all the calculations of the entropy just using the area. 
without having to worry about the bulk entropy. And so that makes it very simple. You can just look at the pictures and you see what happens. Okay. Um, so that's one advantage. Um, another advantage is that the model is going to be explicitly holographic. So it's not going to be possible for there to be tension between the bulk and the boundary calculations of the entropy in this model. They're going to have to agree. Okay? Um, and they will, and they're both going to give a unitary page curve. Um, now, I'll just make a comment. Again, this is kind of tangential. So we also gave another model to show what a holographic version of the non-unitary model that was studied here would look like. I mean, we showed that if you really kind of force this model to be holographic, then actually the RT prescription predicts information loss, uh, as it has to since you made it holographic. Okay. Um, but that's not what we really think happens anyway, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the model. So the basic idea is that um, you arrange, it sounds kind of silly when you first hear it, but you arrange for the big ADS black hole to evaporate not by radiating photons and gravitons and whatever, but by radiating black holes. And moreover, still big black holes, but not as big as the one you started with. So big in the sense of small and big that I said before, but still very small compared to the black hole that you started with. And to make it even simpler, each one is going to end up in its own separate asymptotic universe. So let me try to explain that. OK, so I've got to put this in my talk, too. We can't have a talk without the thermofield double. So, uh, so by now, you're all experts on the thermofield double. And you know that the thermofield double is a state where you have two CFTs. And the spatial geometry is that there's a wormhole which is connecting the two. And here's what it looks like. Okay. Now, what you may not know is that this is actually just a special case of a more general construction. Um, which, uh, in general, can produce spatial geometries, for example, that look like this, where instead of having two CFTs, you have three. And they're connected by a wormhole, which is a fancier wormhole. It's like this kind of pair of pants geometry. Okay, so then you can enter from any of the three exits, and you can all meet in the middle. Uh -huh. Now, here's what our evaporation model looks like. So we've got. So we're going to have one of these pair of pants geometries where there's going to be a big exit, which we say is like the black hole that's evaporating. And then there are going to be a bunch of small exits, which are the Hawking radiation. So each of those small exits is one of these black holes that was produced during the radiation process. And then the dynamics of the radiation are that the octopus grows more legs. Um, so, uh, so she starts out here, say, with three legs. Uh, so th this is not to scale, really. You should think of each of the legs as being quite small compared to the, compared to the head. Um, and then uh, there's one step of radiation, and she grows a fourth leg. And then another step, and she grows a fifth. Um, and then um, so after each step, um, the black hole gets a little bit smaller, and the octopus grows another leg. Um, now, um, it's interesting to talk about these HRT surfaces, these, uh, these gamma r that we use to compute the entropy. So um, there are two. So here I'm going to talk about, for the Hawking radiation, what is this uh, quantum extremal surface? That's what I should call it. Although here it's just the same as the RT surface. So that's this surface gamma. So here for the Hawking radiation, there's kind of two candidates. There's a surface gamma, which is the union of three, these three little circles going around the legs, or here are these four or here are these five. And then there's this surface gamma prime up here, which is kind of the uh, sweat band going around the head of the octopus. Um, and so either of these could be the quantum extremal surface. The answer is that you find the one which has smaller area. And that's the right one. So at early times, um, the ones that are like the ankle bracelets you know, have the smaller area. Because these, these black holes are much smaller than this one. And so say right here, like maybe there's three of them, OK, but this one is much bigger. So the area of this is still smaller than that. So at earlier times, the entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation does not contain the interior, because the ankle bracelets is the HRT surface. So it just contains the exteriors of these three black holes. But as the evaporation proceeds, um, you know, the area of the ankle, ankle bracelets is growing with time. And the area of the headband is decreasing with time. And so eventually, the area of the ankle bracelets is going to be bigger. The area of the headband is going to be smaller. And then the entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation is going to contain the interior. Um, and so in particular, also at that point, um, 
the page curve will turn over because early on the entropy was given by this area of this thing. Um, so, sorry, given by the area of this, which is growing since we keep adding more feet. But then at late times, it's given by the area of the headband, which is shrinking in time, and so it's going to go down. And actually, we can plot it. So here's an explicit plot of the page curve. Um, goes up, goes down. This is, this is the page curve divided by uh, the entropy per foot, per leg of the octopus. Um, now, let me just make a few comments about this. I'm almost done. So first comment is that you know, here, both the bulk and the RT formula agree that it's unitary. So the bulk picture of this is just that you've got a black hole which is entangled with a bunch of other black holes in a pure state. You know what the pure state is. Okay. The HRT picture agrees with that. Okay. It says that the state is pure. It sees that the curve goes down. So you don't have this mismatch that we had in the previous models. Okay. Um, secondly, there's a smooth geometric interior well into the period where the page curve is going down. So once, you know, once the octopus has enough legs, the page curve is going down. But look, this is just perfectly nice and smooth. I know the CFT state that prepared, you know, I know exactly how to prepare it in the CFT. And I know what the bulk geometry is. It's smooth. OK, someone who jumps in here doesn't see anything surprising. No firewall in sight. Um, uh, let me also just say that this interior, so by that I mean the, the body in between the headband and the ankle bracelets, um, is an example of what some people have been calling islands. But I just want to emphasize that after, you know, after the page time, well, or even before the page time, it's a subregion that's in the holographic dual of the joint system. It's not like a subsystem of the radiation. I think there's been some confusion about that. All right. So that's it for the model. Last slide. Let me talk about experiment. Um, so our primary motivation, I have to be honest, was to understand the black hole information problem. We didn't sit down and say, let's come up with an experiment. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, I think there is an interesting experiment to think about here. Um, and this is that we, so we know in the CFT how to prepare these wormholes. It's kind of a generalization of the thermofield double. So, you know, right now people are thinking about how to prepare the thermofield double. This is a bit harder to prepare than that, but it's the same kind of thing. Okay. Um, then, um, so in, the, in your laboratory, after you prepare these, uh, these uh, octopus states, you can look at the boundary correlation functions and also at the entropy of the separate exits of the wormhole. Um, and these depend on the parameters, which are called moduli, of the wormhole. You know, how big one exit is, how big the other exit is, their relative size, all these parameters. Right? You have all these parameters you can tune in the preparation. And this bulk picture gives you a prediction for each value of the parameters for what these things are. Um, and, um, and moreover, it's like directly sensitive to the geometry of the wormhole interior. Like if you don't, if you don't have the interior, like you would not make these predictions. And so if you see them, it's kind of evidence that that wormhole interior is really there uh, and is behaving in the way that we expect. Um, um, moreover, I want to emphasize this because I think it's not emphasized enough in, in this field. Um, these predictions are special to the strongly coupled large N holographic CFTs with gravity duals. So if you did it it's in the Ising model, you wouldn't see this. Okay? And for me, that's kind of a, a litmus test. If the thing that you measure, what happens is you know, if you do it in the Ising model, the same thing happens, then I wouldn't say that you're doing gravity. You know, somehow, to say that you're doing gravity, you're doing something that is not just true in any many-body system. It's true in the special many-body systems that are dual to gravity. Now, you know, the distinction isn't totally sharp. You know, n can be large but finite. The coupling can be large but finite. And there will be some crossover that's continuous from not gravity to gravity. And uh, you know, it's very interesting to study that. But, but I think it is important you know, to somehow, well. You could call it Einstein gravity versus very quantum gravity. Yeah, but what is very quantum gravity? I mean, I don't know. What's the gravity of, that's dual to a qubit? I, I mean. <laughs> Well, this, this dependence of the, uh, of the correlation functions in the entropy on the moduli of the Riemann surface, that's like the, function. the function. The function is different. Yeah, it's a universal function for anything where it's gravity. But uh, in the Ising model, absolutely no reason to get that function. You know, it, 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 you're only going to get that if it's something that has Einstein gravity, if you like, Juan. Um, OK. So, uh, so, OK, now I have to confess, this is probably not the first experiment that we're going to do, or you know, even the fifth or the tenth. Because to prepare these states, you need to implement the Euclidean path integral, which is not 
the most easy thing to do in the world on a quantum computer. You know, there, there are various ideas that float around. Now, I should say, I mean, for the thermal field double, it's the same thing. You know, the preparation of the thermal field double is the Euclidean path integral. Now there, you know, obviously people have thought about it a lot more, so there are more ideas about how to do it. Here, I think no one has thought about it. Uh, but I, it doesn't seem in principle impossible to me. You know, it's something that if you think about it, I don't see why you, you shouldn't be able to do it. Um, so it maybe eventually we'll do it. Uh, and yeah, for me at least, it would be fun to see it work. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Yeah.